Hello, my name is Debbie Leone and I am the Information Services Manager for the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota. I am going to, before I get too far into this, I am going to share my screen so that we can get our webinar started tonight. Okay, there we go. Um, I want to welcome, oops, sorry about that. I want to welcome you all to the first Wellness Wednesday webinar of 2022. Um, our topic is medical cannabis in Minnesota. And we are very excited tonight to be partnering with Leafline Labs to bring you this webinar. Before we get started, I do want to go through a few housekeeping items. The webinar will last one hour and 15 minutes. Um, in order to have the best experience, we do encourage you to close any windows on your devices that may be using a lot of bandwidth, things like music applications and email. Um, we are going to provide a certificate of attendance and that will be sent out in a follow-up email within three business days. The webinar is being recorded and a link to request that recording will be posted on the EFMN website uh, for future viewing options. Um, you may also notice that you um, have closed captioning turned on right now. If you don't want to see those captions, you can go to the bottom of your screen and you can click on the closed captioning icon. It's, it, it, it has a little CC in it. Um, and when you click on that, it will give you, you can follow the prompts to turn those captions off. If you don't see that button, it may be that your screen is not full size and then you can just look for the three little dots down in the right hand corner and you can get to it that way to turn those off. I want to mention that while the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota is hosting this webinar, all content and discussion points are being led and delivered by the staff of LeafLine Labs. The information shared is to inform you of aspects of medical cannabis in Minnesota. However, all potential treatment options should always be discussed with your medical providers. We do want to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. It's right in the center bottom of your screen. Um, this will bring up a box, like you see on the screen here, that where you can type in your question and then hit send. We will hold these questions until the end so that our speakers can answer them all together, but feel free to ask them as you go throughout the evening as they occur to you. You can also use that Q&A uh, box to let us know if you're having any kind of technical problems. Um, Mary Mavison is our executive assistant. She's here in the background. You don't see her, but she is here just to handle just those types of issues you might have and also to help keep me on the straight and narrow and make sure I don't mess things up too badly. So um, let's start with our objectives. Um, we, our objectives tonight are to understand how medical cannabis works within the body, to recognize how medical cannabis, cannabis differ, differs from over-the-counter CBD and, and marijuana products, to learn about the use of medical cannabis in treating epilepsy, and to know how the medical cannabis program in Minnesota works and how you can access it. Our presenters tonight are Noah Simpson and Jordan Barrister. Noah Simpson is the Community Sales and Outreach Manager for LeafLine Labs. He works with organizations and community groups to raise awareness on medical cannabis. Through testimonials and personal experiences, he is focused on sharing the legitimacy of cannabis as a medicine. And our second presenter is Jordan Bannister. Jordan attended school at North Dakota State University and graduated in 2015 with her Doctor of Pharmacy degree. After graduation, she worked at Target CVS Pharmacy for one and a half years before working at LeafLine Labs. She's been practicing there for over five years and she is honored to be able to serve patients through medical cannabis. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Noah. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, Debbie. Um, I know I'm really excited to share everything that we have in this presentation with you all. So um, if we want to go on to the next slide, we'll jump right into it. Um, again, my name is Noah Simpson, Community Sales and Outreach Manager for LeafLine. I've been here for about two years, uh, and I've enjoyed every minute here. Um, Jordan, 
anything that you want to add. I know Debbie covered off on it very well, but um, please introduce yourself. Yes, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Jordan Bannister, one of the pharmacists at Leafline. Like she had previously mentioned, been practicing a little over five years and look forward to sharing information about the program with you this evening. Great, we can go on to the next slide. Um, again, the objectives, Debbie did cover them. Um, before understanding how medical works within the body, we are gonna cover um, you know, some basics on cannabis, the history of cannabis, um, and a lot of different things will, will, will be in with these, uh, the objectives. So if we wanna move on, we can jump right into it and get started. All right, so there is a poll question um, that should be popping up on your screen uh, just to get things started. Uh, were you aware of Minnesota's medical cannabis program before today's presentation? Yes or no? I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer here quick, and then we'll move into it. Okay, great. Well, to those of you who are new, welcome. And to those of you who already do know we exist and the program exists, hopefully this will be even more informative. So um, if we can move on to the next slide, we'll, we'll start out with a brief definition of what cannabis is. All right, so what is cannabis? Most of us are familiar. It has a number of slang names such as weed, pot, reefer, right? The list goes on. Uh, we do prefer to use cannabis as we see that as politically correct in our industry. Um, there are three species of cannabis being cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, cannabis ruderalis. Um, the cannabis plant contains hundreds of chemical compounds called cannabinoids and terpenes, which we will get into uh, much further in depth in a, in a later present or later slide. Uh, but cannabinoids and terpenes are what give the plant its medical properties. You can move on here. Uh, a little further on cannabis, the most famous and important cannabinoids, which I had mentioned, um, are THC and CBD. Now, the plant is not just THC and CBD. There are a number of other cannabinoids that make up the plant, such as CBG, CBC, CBN, uh, THCA, and many more. So again, cannabinoids from the cannabis plant interact with our body's endocannabinoid system. Um, and I know there's some specific questions result, uh, around hemp. Hemp is a variety of cannabis that contains very little THC, and we'll define that further later in the presentation. We can move on. So just some pictures here for us all to visualize the cannabis plant. I know we've all seen the famous fan leaf, um, but here is a picture of a cannabis plant in the young stages of growth. Uh, this is at Leafline Labs Cultivation Facility in Cottage Groves. Uh, Cottage Grove, Minnesota. So again, this is a young stage uh, of the plant. And if you move on to the next slide, you'll see uh, the plant in about mid stage. Um, you can see that there are some flowers developing at the top of the plant. The flowers are where uh, the majority of the cannabinoids are held. So um, maybe if you move on to the next slide, you can see one of those flowers that is fully harvested. Um, from here, we would take that cannabis flower, that bud, uh, we would extract it into medication or we would trim it and sell it as smokable flour. So um, just some visuals for you all there and we can keep moving um, to the next poll question, which is what are the compounds in cannabis called? All right, there's four options here. We did talk about it a few times in those first slides. All right, hopefully everyone's had some time to answer there. And 94% of people got it right. Nice job. That means you are all, all are listening well. Awesome. Um, okay, next slide, please. A brief history of cannabis. Um, as we know it, 
cannabis has been used for centuries, both medicinally, industrially, and recreationally. Uh, cannabis dates back to as far as 500 BC, which is pretty crazy. We know this because of uh, burned cannabis seeds that were actually found in some ancient tombs uh, in China and in Siberia. Um, in America, we'll fast forward quite a ways. Uh, cannabis has been used again medicinally and industrially as well as recreationally. Um, on the industrial side of things, hemp was used to make a variety of products, paper, rope, sails, clothing. Uh, some fun facts to go with that is the first American flag was actually made from hemp and George Washington was a known cultivator uh, of hemp on Mount Vernon. And if we took take a look at the full timeline of cannabis use around the world um, and compare it to how long it's been illegal in America, um, it's been illegal less than 1% of the time it's been in use. So uh, kind of a fascinating statistic there that I, that I wanted to share. Um, and we can move on to the next slide and go through a couple more bullet points here. Um, here here's just some visuals. Um, I mentioned the 500 BC that's representing that top left picture. Um, the next one over to the right is a tincture of cannabis indica in the US pharmacopoeia. Um, reefer madness, uh, marijuana, and then the marijuana tax stamp there, um, which we'll talk about in these next slides. So uh, this first bullet point, I think is just cool to point out. Um, Sir William Brooke O'Shaughnessy discovered cannabis extract could be used for uh, a variety of symptoms to alleviate a variety of symptoms in the early 1800s. Now this led to uh, cannabis becoming a mainstream medicine in the West and was added to the U.S. pharmacopoeia. Um, fast forwarding to 1930, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics is created and led by Harry Anslinger. Um, that Federal Bureau of Narcotics is otherwise known to, known as today uh, as the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, and upon creation, uh, the Bureau was urging federal action. Um, in addition, during this time period, new medications are coming to the market with medical, um, competing with medical marijuana, such as some of those opium derived drugs. Um, 1936, reefer madness, which we're all aware of, I'm sure, and government propaganda cautions the use of marijuana. Marijuana is starting to get a bad rep. Uh, 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act is imposed, which basically makes it impossible um, to use cannabis, grow cannabis, uh, sell cannabis at all. Um, 1964, THC, that first cannabinoid, that compound within the plant is discovered by Dr. Raphael McCollum, um, kind of the godfather of cannabis uh, research. And moving on to the next slide, it's going to bring us to 1970 and the Controlled Substance Act, which lists uh, cannabis as a Schedule One drug, uh, which states drugs with currently no accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Now we know that's not true, um, but currently cannabis is still listed as a federal one drug. However, if we go to the next slide, we know that states are all making their own decisions in regards to cannabis laws uh, currently, um, despite being illegal at the federal level. There's actually 36 states that have legalized cannabis for medical use, plus the 11 states uh, and Washington, D.C. that have legalized adult use. Now, you know, taking in the populations of these states that have passed these medical cannabis or, or recreational cannabis laws, 70% uh, of U.S. citizens live in a state where they have access to cannabis. Um, that's, that's quite a number. And finally, um, support for cannabis legalization continues to grow in the U.S. up to 67% in 2020. So uh, we'll continue to see lots of changes in, in regards to states specific laws and how things progress at a national level. Um, but for now and today, we're going to focus on Minnesota. So I will move on to the next poll question, which should be popping up here shortly. How far does cannabis use date back in our world history? I think we'll all get this one right. So um, I think it'd be fair to close the poll here. And then I am going to 84%. Awesome. Um, that's awesome. All right. So I'm going to pass it on to Jordan and she is going to take it from here. And then I will talk to you all soon. All right, everyone. I'm going to start by giving you all information on how the cannabis plant works in the body. 
Cannabis as a medication is unique because of the chemical compounds that are produced by the plant. Cannabinoids are a diverse class of naturally occurring compounds that do mimic compounds that are actually produced by your body. The two most famous compounds produced include THC and CBD. CBD is the main component that we use to help patients with epilepsy, but depending on patient needs, we may in varying amounts of the THC as well. The cannabinoids from the plant do interact with your body's own unique endocannabinoid system as well. The next slide will give you a visual representation on how the endocannabinoid system works. Identified in the 1980s, the endocannabinoid system is involved in a variety of physiological processes, such as appetite, mood, and pain sensation. Then as you can see on the photo there, compounds produced by the human body and the cannabis plant can bind to both your CB1 and CB2 receptors. Cannabis as a medication is very unique because it has significantly lower risks of side effects or addiction as compared to opiate medications. As a pharmacist, that is one of my favorite parts about this medication. Um, then we can move on to the next slide. So here again is going to be a visual representation of that system um, over the last few years at LeafLine. It's really been amazing to see what this body system is capable of. I have seen patients successfully taper off other prescription medications to treat their symptoms. And then we can move on to the next slide as well. So we are going to go through different parts of the endocannabinoid system. It's a natural system in the human body, regulates many important bodily functions, such as appetite, digestion, immune function, inflammation, neuroinflammation, mood, sleep, motor control, temperature regulation, memory, and pain. Um, one unique part of Jordan, I think you accidentally muted yourself. I apologize. Can you still all hear me? All right. So assuming that you guys can hear me now. Um, we can. We can hear you okay. now. Fantastic. So as far as the bodily functions, you'll just see that list there that it can help control. And then as far as the different parts that the system is made up of, you have the endocannabinoid, the receptor, and the enzyme. The two most common endocannabinoids include anatomide and 2-AG. And then the main receptors that they bind to are CB1 and CB2. However, um, I also find it interesting, they can bind to various capsaicin and G-protein coupled receptors as well to give patient additional benefit. And then enzymes like FAAH and MAGI help break down the anatomide and the other endocannabinoids. All right, and then we can move on to the next slide. When we're looking at endocannabinoids versus phytocannabinoids, you'll see that both of them can do the same thing. The difference is the phytocannabinoids come from outside your body from the cannabis plant. And then the endocannabinoids are created in your body. Um, cannabis contains many different phytocannabinoids, including THC and CBD, that interact with your body's system. Okay, and then going further, we'll see the effects of THC may help patients with things such as decreasing pain, improving their sleep, helping with appetite, anxiety, as well as nausea. And then CBD, you have anti-inflammatory neuroprotectant, and it can also help to decrease some of the psychoactive effects of THC. THC in the cannabis plant is the stereotypical high that patients may get. There's a slight sense of euphoria for some patients in the beginning, but when you're treating epilepsy, CBD is the main component, and it actually dampens down some of those sedative effects that a patient may have in the beginning. So we can you know, work on therapy depending on what side effects each patient may have. Um, also can help with anxiety and depression without causing impairment. Right, and then moving on, 
Um, again, talking about THC, that most well-known and typically the most prevalent cannabinoid, it again is that psychoactive compound that can give patients that feeling of being high at the start. But research has shown THC can work to reduce or even eliminate pain, nausea, and stress while helping to stimulate appetite and combat insomnia. You know, it's amazing as a pharmacist, I've never seen one medication that can help so many different things with so few side effects. Next, we'll be looking at CBD. Um, CBD is that non-psychoactive cannabinoid that can help with inflammation, pain, and anxiety often used for reducing symptoms in patients suffering from seizures and spasm disorders such as epilepsy and MS. And then in the next slide, there'll be a visualization of your system. As you can see, the CB1 receptors are going to be mainly in your central nervous system to help with pain, nausea, appetite, sleep, and then antiprolific effects. And then you'll see the CB2 receptors are populated in the periphery to help with inflammation, immune function, pain, and an also anti-prolific effects. On the next slide, you'll see different examples of terpenes. So terpenes are a hydrocarbon responsible for the flavor and scent of the plant, as well as numerous other benefits. Terpenes are not only found in cannabis, they enhance many things from medication to skincare. Each different strain of cannabis has its own aroma based on the different terpenes. And then the following slide will explain how terpenes work together. THC, CBD, and other cannabinoids and terpenes all work together through what is called the entourage effect. The idea that compounds within cannabis work together to produce a greater effect than if they were separate. And then the example they list here is full spectrum CBD versus broad versus isolate. So CBD alone may not provide as great of a benefit as when paired with other cannabinoids and terpenes such as THC. In our cobalt oral suspension, that is what I often start to treat patients with seizure disorders. There is a 20 to one ratio of CBD to THC. So there's not enough THC in there where a patient would have any level of impairment, just enough THC to give that CBD a little bit extra boost and then help it work better. Now we'll move on to our next poll question. And so question, what cannabinoids are best known for their medicinal benefits? All right, and then Oh, you guys are listening. Awesome job. <laughs> All right. And then in the next slide here, we're going to see that cannabis has become increasingly popular over the last few years for epilepsy treatment. Being that cannabis is a class one substance federally, it is difficult to study it how we would like. However, anecdotally, I've been truly amazed at what I've seen for seizure patients over the last few years. I've had patients who have been able to completely taper off some of the other seizure medications that they're taking. I've had patients that have been able to reduce their dose or with the combination of prescription medications plus medical cannabis have been able to get their seizures under control after years of having uncontrolled epilepsy. Um, then the next slide kind of talks about the next question here, if medical cannabis can help control seizure disorders. Um, there is evidence to support the use of cannabis to control seizure disorders, even despite it being a class one substance, we have been able to collect that data. And we, as we talked about prior, we found that CBD rich formulations have been the most successful in treating seizure and epilepsy disorders. And then again, just talks about how CBD has anti-convulsant properties with fewer side effects. Then the next slide should reference a few different studies. And there actually was a pharmaceutical company which led the first FDA approved CBD based formulation. CBD in medical cannabis continues to be researched and studied as a treatment option 
for a variety of conditions, including epilepsy and seizure disorders. And then as always, before making any prescription medication changes or any adjustments to your current therapy, we recommend talking to your doctor um, before using medical cannabis. And then moving on to the next slide, it's going to give you guys some interesting statistics. There are currently around 700 patients in Minnesota's medical cannabis program that are qualified under seizures. And there are 2,300 qualified under severe and persistent muscle spasms. Um, as a lot of you know, in that pulsed ictal state, there can be a lot of pain and muscle tension. So I found patients are able to get relief from that as well. At LeafLine, we do recommend products and dosing specific to each patient's condition and medical history. And again, typically we go with that to cobalt, the CBD dominant, start with the low dose and have you gradually increase, see how your symptoms respond. Um, when you do your initial consult, we go through any drug interactions to look for and how to monitor those. Thankfully, they're very few and Typically insignificant, simple lab monitoring can look for that. Um, and then for the patients, we will offer return consults at no charge anytime. We want to be highly accessible so you can come to us anytime if you're having breakthrough seizures adjustments. And then sometimes we do add in varying amounts of THC to the cobalt to help with postictal pain as well as seizure control as well. Okay, then moving on to the next slide, it just again talks about further how we're treating patients. I'm using that CBD base, you'll have lower incidence of dizziness, drowsiness, and side effects. And then with the help of the neurologist, patients sometimes are able to taper off some of their other medications or cannabis can be done in conjunction with them. We are more than happy to help patients either way. And then also happy to work with your provider if they're interested in following up with us to work on your care plan together. Um, again, screening for drug interactions. And then as far as therapeutic levels, it's typically something you'd be monitored for anyway, so it's not very burdensome on the patient at all. And then moving on to the next slide, I'll turn it back over to Noah. Thank you very much, Jordan. Um, hopefully that all made sense to everyone. I know that was a lot of information, so please uh, throw some questions um, in the Q&A down there. We'd love to answer any questions that you guys have. So um, just a patient story here um, that I think is helpful to share. If you could go back one slide there, um, this is an example from a few years back, 11-year-old Hiroki, Cottage Grove, Minnesota, was diagnosed with Phelan McDermott syndrome, uh, epilepsy, and autism, um, you know, based on our interview with his family, medical cannabis brought stability to Hiroki and his family. Um, before medical cannabis, Hiroki was seeing 22 specialists and taking up to eight different medications per day. After medical cannabis, he now sees three specialists and only takes two medications uh, that, we, that we know of today. Um, Hiroki is now more aware, present and interacting with family members. Misa, Hiroki's mother, believes her son of her son's life went from a one to a 10 um, with medical cannabis. So just a great story there. Um, in the next slide, you'll see a picture of Hiroki with a big smile on his face. Um, exactly what we're trying to provide to our, our patients here at LeafLine Labs. So uh, we can continue on. Um, I know there were a lot of questions and when I'm out talking with different groups um, around Minnesota, I get a lot of questions on what's the difference between medical cannabis and over-the-counter CBD. Um, let's talk about over-the-counter CBD to start. Um, so 2018, the United States Farm Bill was passed that allowed the cultivation and sale of hemp products. Now, these products are held to a standard that they must contain less than 0.3% THC. Again, hemp versus cannabis, they're both cannabis varieties. Hemp, on one hand, is going to be dominant in CBD and low in THC, whereas cannabis is going to have higher percentages of THC versus CBD. So I, I really compare them as kind of like cousins. So um, with the passing of the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, there's a large influx of CBD and hemp companies. I'm sure we're all aware of one um, that we have in our town, uh, just locally. But this led to some issues. 
uh, just in terms of quality control. There are, are a lot of very good quality companies out there, um, but there are some instances where the quality standards are not met by some companies. So if we move on to the next slide, I just have a few recommendations um, in terms of purchasing any CBD. My recommendations would be to properly vet your source and where you're buying your CBD from. So uh, something that Leafline has done in past week, we do have two CBD brands that are available for over-the-counter purchase. Uh, we do carry them in our dispensaries as well. Um, but these products, you want to make sure that they're third-party lab tested. They provide a COA, which is our certificate of authentication. Um, make sure they're GMP certified. They have the GMP stamp, good manufacturing practice. Um, and manufactured in an FDA approved facility. Now that brings up a good point. Um, the FDA does not yet regulate hemp derived products. That would be a huge step in terms of the hemp industry. Uh, that'd be a big win. Um, as far as I know, there are no um, steps that the FDA is gonna take to start regulating um, that anytime soon. But uh, many quality companies remain in the market and we just advise you doing your research before purchasing. So. If you want to move on to the next slide, uh, medical cannabis in Minnesota. So here's some differences between over-the-counter and medical cannabis in Minnesota. So medical cannabis in Minnesota is overseen by the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, specifically the Office of Medical Cannabis, which oversees both manufacturers, making sure that we are producing quality product and that we are staying in tune with compliance and regulation. Now, uh, over-the-counter hemp products, must have less than 0.3% THC, which I had mentioned. Medical cannabis products are not held to the same standard. So Jordan had mentioned um, we have different ratios. Uh, we don't necessarily go off percentages at all times. Yeah, for example, here, 21, 20 to one ratio of CBD to THC uh, helps induce the entourage effect and can provide a greater therapeutic relief uh, versus having such a minimal uh, percentage of CBD or THC in the medicine. So in Minnesota, products go through rigorous testing protocols, both in-house and by state approved labs. Um, so we know that we're putting out quality product to our patients. Our products are grown indoors to ensure reliability and consistency. And we use the latest scientific research in pure plant derived ingredients to grow our cannabis. Next slide. All right. Poll question. Over-the-counter hemp products must have less than what percent THC? I think everyone has probably answered. Hopefully we all got this correct. Awesome, 88%. Um, 0.3% THC is the correct answer. Uh, that is the federal legal limit for over-the-counter hemp products. So, okay, let's talk about Minnesota's medical cannabis program. A little bit of a review here. Um, Minnesota's, it's overseen by the Minnesota Department of Health and Office of Medical Cannabis. Currently, the program is an extract-based only program, meaning that we are growing these cannabis plants um, and then we are extracting the cannabinoids and terpenes um, out of the plant and making it into some traditional uh, medications that we'll, we'll cover off on the delivery methods in a later slide, but um, like capsules or oral suspensions, uh, sublingual sprays, just to name a few. Now, the program is undergoing some major changes right now. Smokable flour will be available uh, beginning March 1st. So next week, smokable flour will be launched into the program. The main reason for that being added to the program is to help decrease costs for patients. Um, extract based only. Uh, we can't cross state lines. We can't outsource. We're a vertically integrated company. So um, it does, you know, spike costs a bit. So um, smokable flour will decrease those costs for the patients. And that will be available only for 21 and older patients. So um, Joining the medical cannabis program in Minnesota requires a qualifying condition, requires a Minnesota licensed healthcare practitioner to certify. Uh, there are only two companies allowed to provide medical cannabis, which is Leafline Labs, as well as Green Goods, our competitor. Um, there's limited accessible locations. Right now, the state 
allows each provider um, or each manufacturer to have up to eight locations uh, each. Right now, LeafBlind has five, will hopefully be to seven before summer. Um, and then we'll still have room to add an eighth location, which we're not sure exactly uh, where we're going to put those, but we're located in St. Paul, Egan, Minnesota, St. Uh, St. Paul, St. Cloud, Wilmer, Hibbing, and then we'll be opening up in Mankato as well as uh, Coon Rapids. So, and, and overall, Minnesota has one of the most restrictive medical cannabis programs in the United States. So next slide, please. All right, so here is the list of qualifying conditions. There are 17 in total, um, tractable pain, cancer, glaucoma, HIV AIDS, Tourette syndrome, PTSD, muscle spasms, epilepsy and seizures, IBD, ALS, terminal illnesses, autism, obstructive sleep apnea, Alzheimer's disease, chronic pain, sickle cell disease and chronic motor or vocal tic disorder. I'll add that the program did not start with 17 qualifying conditions every year. Patients and Minnesotans have the ability to petition uh, to add new qualifying conditions. So uh, this, latest, this last year, um, sickle cell disease and chronic motor or vocal tic disorder uh, were added into the program. Um, so there is an opportunity to add more conditions in the future. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so here's a five-step process. I'll quickly run through this, um, and then we'll, we'll go into these steps a little bit further in depth. Uh, but step one, identify your qualifying condition, one of the 17. Uh, two, find a healthcare practitioner who certifies conditions. We do have a list on our website as a resource for patients, because uh, not all healthcare practitioners are required to certify patients for medical cannabis in Minnesota. It is a voluntary uh, program on that side. Um, number three, step three, complete your enrollment application, provide proof of ID and pay the annual fee within 90 days of certification. Uh, there is an annual fee. We'll talk about cost in, I believe the next slide. Um, uh, number four, receive your approval email from the Office of Medical Cannabis. So once you uh, complete your enrollment application, um, the state may take up to 30 days to uh, approve your application and then you'll receive that email um, once you're finally accepted. And then step five would be calling Leafline Labs and meeting with our pharmacists on what we call an initial, initial consultation. Uh, that's where you would meet with a pharmacist like Jordan. You would talk through your qualifying condition, your medical history, um, and really uh, together you guys would make a plan uh, to use medical cannabis to combat whatever condition uh, you're seeing us for. So. To move on to the next slide, the program costs. Now I'm sure many of you have questions regarding cost. Um, right now, there is an annual registration fee of $200. Uh, that is a fee that is paid to the state, to the Office of Medical Cannabis, to, um, that allows them to keep their doors open and running and overseeing the medical cannabis program. Um, that fee is reduced to $50 for Minnesotans receiving any sort of assistance like SSI, SSD, I won't name them all, but you guys can all read them there. Um, there are reduced fees available for those that need it. Um, I think it's interesting to note that uh, there was a bill proposed to decrease the state registration fee from $200 to, I believe, $49 or $50. Um, that has not passed, but um, it is being discussed in this latest session. So that would be um, a big win for the medical cannabis program to decrease that cost of entry for patients who are looking to take advantage of the program. Um, also, there is a 15% discount on products for patients on assistance. This is both LeafLine and Green Goods it's across the board. Um, and additionally, we do uh, try to run promotions both monthly on products and for new patients to uh, make it as affordable as possible. So uh, next slide, please. A brief overview on LeafLine. I know we've talked about it a lot already, but LeafLine, um, the premium medical cannabis cultivator in Minnesota, produces high quality products for patients seeking to improve their quality of life. We do this through cultivating our plants indoors. This guarantees reliability and consistency. 
using the latest scientific research and pure plant derived ingredients, creating the best full spectrum cannabis products on the market, undergoing rigorous testing, as mentioned, both in-house and by an independent lab to ensure purity and safety for our patients. And our strategy is simple, consistently deliver the best of cannabis. Um, let's move on to the next slide where I'm going to pass it off to Jordan. And she's going to talk about some of our medications and delivery methods. All right. So here you'll just see a visualization of some of the capsules as well as lozenges. Um, we have many various dosage forms. Cannabis is not a one size fits all medication. So we do have different therapeutics available for different patients. Long acting forms that we would have include the capsules as well as the oral suspension. And then for shorter acting or breakthrough symptoms, we have a sublingual spray for under the tongue, a vaporizer that is inhaled, topical creams that may be put on specific areas that cause pain, and then an intermediate acting form would be the lozenge. Those work in about 20 to 60 minutes and last four to six hours, so it's kind of a nice in-between point. And then next week we have flower coming. So then we move on to the next slide. And then we'll see, it talks about the different cannabis families that we have at LeafLine. So tangerine is going to be higher amounts of THC, may be used for sleep, severe pain, nausea, vomiting, appetite, and anxiety. Middle family that we have is called Heather. I tell patients to think H for half and half, half THC, half CBD, may be used for mood, nerve pain, inflammation, and muscle spasms. And also that CBD paired with the THC takes away some of those head effects, well suited for daytime. And then cobalt, higher amounts of CBD can be used to decrease inflammation and anxiety without impairment. And then again, that is our main treatment for epilepsy and seizure patients. Then moving on to the next slide, Again, just kind of reviewing what Nola spoke about. We have that 17 qualifying conditions. Um, we do have a lot of patients that are certified for more than one condition. Our top three qualifying conditions include intractable pain and chronic pain, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. And then other common qualifying conditions include severe and persistent muscle spasms, cancer, obstructive sleep apnea, seizures and epilepsy, as well as autism. And then moving on, I will hand it right back over to Noah. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Um, all right, so let's talk about the steps to join the program a little further in depth here. Um, again, so step one is identifying your qualifying condition. Um, so whether it be one of these 17 or three of the 17, um, step one is just identifying your qualifying condition to join the program. Um, next slide, please, would be finding a healthcare practitioner. As I mentioned, not all healthcare practitioners certify patients for the medical cannabis program. Healthcare practitioners do need to sign up with the state in order to certify patients. Um, so it's not like they can do this uh, before signing up with the state. They need to register with the state so the state knows who's certifying patients for medical cannabis in Minnesota. Um, so ask your Minnesota licensed physician physician's assistant or advanced practice registered nurse if they can certify you for the program. Those are the only three that can certify you for the program. If they are unable to certify you at the current time, we do provide a list of resources on our website, which is linked here. Um, this is a very helpful, we get a lot of, we, we get a lot of good feedback on this list. So um, we're excited to be able to offer this resource to patients who may be having some trouble finding a, a provider to certify them for the program. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, completing the enrollment process. So before, before seeing your healthcare practitioner, you're gonna wanna print out the patient email and acknowledgement form. This is available on the OMC web website. Um, give this form to your healthcare practitioner at your appointment. So during the appointment, give your email address to your healthcare practitioner ask for an appointment summary and list of current medications, you're going to want to take this list to your initial consultation at LeafLine Labs. Um, after your healthcare practitioner certifies your condition, you will receive an email from the OMC that contains confirmation of your condition and your unique online registration link. And we will move on to the next slide here. Once you receive your certification email, 
you will now go through the registration process. You will need your government issued photo ID, driver's license, passport. This program is only available to Minnesota residents. Uh, your government medical assistance plan, if applicable, uh, digital camera or cell phone to capture image of both ID and medical assistance plan. Um, and then a, finally a credit card or other payment method to pay that annual registration fee of either $200 or $50. Um, so then you're gonna follow the link in your email to register. Please check your spam or junk folders. These emails do tend to, to end up in that folder for whatever reason. Um, so if you're not seeing it, be sure to check that. Uh, when your registration has been approved, you will be notified by email. Um, and the approval process, as I had mentioned earlier, can take up to 30 days after registration is completed. Now, I will say normally it does not take 30 days, but the state, um, if they do get overrun with new patients coming to the program, it's going to be pushed out longer. Um, so uh, please, next slide. All right. And then the final step is going to be meeting with a pharmacist at Leafline Labs, and you will pick up your medication that same day. So schedule an appointment with Leafline Labs. You can call us. Um, that would be my recommendation on setting up an appointment. That's the best way to get a hold of us. Complete the patient self-evaluation available on your medical cannabis registry account before your visit. Um, that is required before every visit. Um, so what to bring? Your government issued photo ID that will be checked, a list of prescribed medications, the visit summary from your healthcare practitioner who certified your qualifying condition and, and payment for your medicine. Um, during the initial consultation, a pharmacist will review your account and recommended medications. A few more patient testimonials here, um, just some great stories. We receive a ton of patient testimonials every single week. Um, some of the ones that I've witnessed recently that stand out to me are uh, medical cannabis helps me cope with my terminal illness. Thank you, Leafline. Medical cannabis has given me my life back. My pain is now managed and I can actually get out and live life. Thank you so much, Leafline. I've had to be on pain medications for so long. The vaping helps a lot with the pain in my PTSD. I've noticed a big improvement in my quality of life. Thank you. Cannabis is the only thing that touches my severe arthritis pain. I love Leafline. This has been a lifesaver for me and has raised my quality of life. I appreciate how simple medical cannabis is, with no side effects. Um, I know none of those are specific to epilepsy, but I wanted to share those. Um, let's move on to the next slide where we have another poll question, which should be popping up here. After today's discussion, would you consider using medical cannabis? Yes, maybe, or no. All right, hopefully everyone's had a chance to answer here. Great. Awesome, that's, that's awesome results. Um, great, so let's move on to the next slide. Again, this is where we're located. Egan, Hibbing, Coon Rapids. Man or Coon Rapids and Mankato will be coming soon. Uh, where we're currently open right now is Egan, Hibbing, St. Paul, Wilmer, and St. Cloud. Um, and please note that there are other locations. It's not just LeafLine operating in the state. Uh, Green Goods does have eight active locations. Um, so there may be an accessible location closer than you think. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you need help joining the program, I'm happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one or just any other general questions about the program. Um, or just the need for more information, I'm happy to help. Um, please take a picture of my information there or reach out uh, if needed. So, and thank you. I see that the Q&A box is uh, very full. So would love to start uh, answering some of these questions that you all have, Jordan. Um, I will ask for some of your help on these. Debbie, is there anything that you have to add here? Yes, no, I'll just go ahead and go through these and you can answer them and I'll take care of um, getting them 
fixed up afterward. <laughs> so the first question, and we do, we have a lot of good questions. This is great. Um, the first one is, can chemicals within cannabis be extracted and used medically without the intoxicating effects of THC? Great question. Um, I'll, I guess I'll start here, Jordan. Please follow up with anything. Sure. Um, but yeah, so we are an extract-based only program right now. Um, a lot of our medications uh, we extract CBD and THC and all the chemical compounds from the plant, the cannabinoids and terpenes. And we put them into different medications. We have the different product families so that we can have desired effects based on, on your needs. And I'll let the pharmacist answer the rest of that question. Absolutely. So as far as CBD alone as an isolate substance can provide benefit, but that's why I prefer the cobalt suspension having that 20 to one ratio. It wouldn't be the THC potent enough to do any intoxicating or those psychoactive effects, um, but just enough to help with that entourage effect. So there are some benefits, but I do find that when paired with THC and other cannabinoids and terpenes, the therapeutic outcome is better for patients. Great, thank you. Next question, um, and you touched on this a little bit, what research has been done regarding cannabis compounds and epilepsy, and if it will work for everyone or not? So as far as the research, the toughest part is that it's a class one substance, um, but I have seen many studies and we actually do have a folder of those collected. Um, I'm sure we could send those out if you're interested in looking at the specific statistics that we have there, and then Anecdotally, I like to think of what I'm doing as one giant case study, and I've truly been amazed by all of this over the last few years. Um, and then also, I saw someone had a question. Oh, let's see. Epilepsy will work for everyone. Unfortunately, there are some patients who don't receive seizure benefit from it, um, but I would say the majority of my patients have got a drop. And this is really rough ballpark at least 30 to 50 percent um, some have been a hundred percent and then if you're still having seizures you know, we can definitely work with the other prescription medications you're taking also i had kind of a follow-up to that that i was wondering about which is does medical cannabis work for all types of seizures or just for the convulsive seizures so it does work for many different types um, there are just some patients who are extremely refractory for whatever their own system, but I've seen patients with Dravet syndrome, um, Bellweger syndrome, a lot of really complex patients that have gotten extremely improved quality of life due to seizure reduction. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, someone was asking if they could get a copy of this presentation, would, would you be open to letting us send out a copy of this PowerPoint to folks if they want it sure sure yeah we can send it out in, okay. in pdf format and yeah. i can certainly set yeah it would definitely be a C and we'll, we'll be following up with certificates of completion so i could also send those a, a copy a pdf copy of the powerpoint if they're interested and jordan you have mentioned the the studies too should people just contact you directly or noah directly if they're interested in getting copies of those studies I can help out with, with that side of things. We're more than happy to share the studies that we have uh, on file. Great. And I'd love to help too with these last few weeks. I have been booked front to end with the flower coming and I don't think I've ever been so busy in my entire career, which has been great. But once things slow down too, I'd love to be more involved. I'm helping you guys with that also. Great. Well, we will be calling on you when we get questions we can't answer about medical cannabis. The next question, um, my son is 16 months old and is taking 60 milligrams of CBD and 3 milligrams of THC two times a day for seizure control. I think the CBD is reducing his appetite and I'd like to know more about CBD and appetite and how much, t and how much THC is necessary to correct it. Also, how much THC by body weight does it take to make a person feel high? So two oh, questions and, there. Yes. So as far as the first part, so it looks like approximately 5% THC twice a day. Um, 
as far as CBD and appetite, this, there have been a few different studies. Some say that it would slightly reduce appetite. Um, the most recent ones I've seen shown it's appetite neutral. And then as far as how much THC he would need to correct it, um, at that point, I would probably add in a tangerine oral suspension in small amounts. So we can keep that CBD where it's at by slowly increasing the THC. Um, I would do that slowly just to make sure that your child wouldn't have, you know, dizziness, drowsiness, anything like that. Um, and then we could also do it, I know being 16 months old, the sublingual spray may be difficult, so I would recommend adding in small amounts of our tangerine oral suspension to fine tune until we get appetite where it needs to be. And then THC is not really a medication that's dosed by body weight, which is interesting. Um, there are some patients who may have higher tolerance than others, and they may weigh twice as much. Um, so that's why I do start all patients very low and give you instructions on how to titrate your dose slowly. Um, we don't want you to have you know, unpleasant side effects or feel sleepy during the day when you're not wanting to. So that's why we go through specific plans for each patient and then start low and go slow. Also finding your lowest effective dose helps keep cost in check, which is always a really good thing, very important as well. Right. Thank you, that's great. Um, and I know it's hard to, you, you don't want to be, you know, um, treating people without having actually spoken to them and getting all the details. So I appreciate you, you um, giving that very thoughtful answer. Um, next question is about the shelf life of medical cannabis. What kind of shelf life are you looking at? So typically a year from purchase, um, most of our medications you know, we're getting transport very often. So it's very rare. I think the most I've seen is nine months out from when the medication was dispensed, but it's not something where it would be expiring within a handful of months. We're definitely checking through our inventory to make sure you'll be able to use the medication that you purchase. Okay, great. The next question says, thank you for sharing this good information on treatment options. My 18 year old son was diagnosed with JME last year by a physician at Mayo. As an adult, he has reached out to his physician to see if he could be put on a CBD based therapy, but she explained that she does not prescribe this as an option. So what are his options as he's very interested in exploring this as a therapeutic option? He's currently on Depakote. Any guidance you may provide is truly appreciated. Yes, of course. So there are, you know, unfortunately some providers that are comfortable with it or due to where they're working, not able to if it's federal restriction. So if you go to our website, leaflinelabs.com, you can type in your zip code and there are different providers in the area that gave us permission to publish their information for patients who are looking um, to go with medical cannabis also. Okay, great. I did notice that I looked, I, I just had looked at your list and I didn't see any neuro, neuro, excuse me, neurology clinics on the list. Um, yet I know you said that there are people with epilepsy being you know, treated with medical cannabis. So how do they, if they're not on your list, how does somebody go about finding a healthcare provider? Or did I just not see them and they're there? So as far as specific neurology clinics, they may just not have given us permission. I think a lot of providers were concerned they would be, you know, getting very, very large call volumes about the medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. So if you are looking for a neurologist specifically, um, I would recommend checking within some of the different health systems that do have providers. Um, I think I've seen providers through Centricare, U of M, Mayo. So, and if you're not comfortable trying to find one specifically, I've always recommended you could call anonymously and say, are there any neurologists that are certifying for medical cannabis or that may be agreeable to it if you're looking for different opinions as well. Okay, so just call the clinics directly and ask if they have anybody who is certifying. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. 
Um, I think you may have covered, yeah, you probably covered this, but just in case there's anything that needs to be added, um, what is the first step in trying medical cannabis as a treatment and what healthcare providers can prescribe? So maybe just kind of review that, who, who can actually prescribe and how to get started. Yep. So there are three types of healthcare practitioners that can prescribe in a state being a medical doctor, a physician's assistant, or an advanced practice registered nurse. Um, not all healthcare, healthcare practitioners are required to participate in the program. It is voluntary. Um, so finding one can be difficult as we talked about. Um, but the first step in trying medical cannabis as a treatment is identifying that qualifying condition and seeing that healthcare practitioner. Those are the, that's the biggest part that you guys need to, uh, take advantage of to get started. So. Great. Will anxiety or depression ever be listed as a qualifying condition? So as I mentioned, uh, qualifying conditions are petitioned for yearly. Anxiety was pushed heavily or heavily uh, for this year to be as a new qualifying condition for the program. Um, it was denied and I do not have uh, the complete answer to whether or not they will ever become uh, qualifying conditions or not. But um, I know there was a lot of um, research and a lot of discussion behind anxiety uh, this year and for now it will not be added and I'll add a little bit to that too Noah I think they had a few providers that were concerned it would increase anxiety and if a patient were to take an extremely high dose of THC there can be anxiety that's induced but I think you know unfortunately some of that's misunderstanding if we have a patient at a low enough therapeutic level it should be helping with anxiety and not causing it so that's where some of that may have come from as well so educating the folks who are making those decisions sounds like it could be key yeah. <laughs> do you have a list of drugs that they can or cannot interact with as far as epilepsy so are there specific epilepsy drugs that the medical cannabis might inter interact with negatively? So I've never seen um, a medication that would be a complete contraindication for cannabis. For example, if you were taking Lamictal, um, then I would just recommend getting the labs drawn within the first 30 days or so, just to make sure that therapeutic level is staying where it needs to be. So typically all it would be would be a simple blood draw to make sure your medications are staying where they need to be. I haven't ever had a patient that hasn't been able to take cannabis due to the other medications they're on. Okay, great. Um, the next question is about Epidiolex. Is it only CBD based? Yes, there's no THC with Epidiolex, which is Personally, where I think the issue is, you're not having those other cannabinoids, terpenes, and THC to provide the entourage effect. Okay. And just to clarify for those who are listening who may not be familiar, Epidiolex is the FDA-approved um, cannabis-derived medication. Uh, what about decreasing Omphi and or Depakote? I think the question may be is if you were to start on medical cannabis, would there be an opportunity to decrease those other medications? I have personally seen patients come off of both of those medications. Um, so that was amazing to see. Sometimes the negative side effects of mood were affecting most patients with the medication. So that's why the parents were really looking to decrease some of those. Um, and I've also seen patients that take on or Depakote together with cannabis that are doing well. Um, not every patient is able to fully taper off. Some may go halfway. Some may have just been uncontrolled with prescription medications and need cannabis added to use the two together to get the effect they need. Okay, great. Like everything else with epilepsy, it seems like it's very individualized. Yes. I'm not sure I'm understanding what they're asking for here. Um, what does this do to the threshold of infections? I'm, when I read that, I think they may be asking, you know, would being taking medical cannabis increase or decrease your risk of getting infections? So it should be 
you know, overall neutral, but there are some terpenes that have been shown to be antimicrobial, antibacterial, um, but it's not currently a qualifying condition. So that's not something I've necessarily been tracking personally. Okay. But there might be some effect. That's really interesting. Yeah. Does taking pure oil, I'm assuming they mean CBD oil, decrease appetite? Some patients, you know, if you were to take a very large amount of oil, um, may cause upset stomach, diarrhea, but typically if you take the medication with food, you shouldn't be seeing those side effects, especially because our cobalt is so concentrated, you're not going to be needing 20 plus milliliters or large amounts of oil in your stomach to be getting that relief. And I'm assuming that when you recommend a particular thing that you, the patients are given that guidance as to how to take it with food or without food. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Does this help Lennox Gastel patients? I think you, I know you mentioned Dravé. Yes, I have seen patients get relief there too. Um, again, those patients, um, and again, this is very ballpark, so bear with me, but I'm thinking 30 to 50% drop in reduction. Um, like I say, some patients are becoming fully seizure free, but everyone is so individualized. Right. Oops. Um, the next question, they'd like you to speak a little bit more on how medical cannabis works specifically with epilepsy. Sure, as far as recept, are you meaning like through the different receptors? I, yeah, I'm not sure. Why, why don't you just speak to whatever you sure. feel? Because they, they didn't give a lot more detail on what they mean. Um, sure, absolutely. So CBD is going to be attaching to those CB2 receptors in the periphery, the exact mechanism is not actually known, which was always so interesting to me. Um, but I'm typically seeing 20 to 40 milligrams twice a day is that good starting point. And then if you could, you know, specify an exactly a little bit more in your question, Charlotte, I'd be happy to answer to the best of my ability. Yeah, if there's something more specific you're looking for, let us know. Mm -hmm. um, um, in the meantime, I'll move on to the next one. I'm, I'm so excited. We have so many great questions. Sometimes yeah. we do webinars and it's like pulling teeth to get people to ask questions. So I'm really happy that people are, are um, participating so well. Um, cannabis, marijuana is not a class one substance everywhere in the world. Have other countries done significant research on its medical benefits, particularly in regard to epilepsy? That is where some of the studies that we have have come from, have been from different countries. So we could definitely get some of those sent out to you. Um, as far as America, hopefully we'll get there soon. <laughs> so it's not so much not having access to the studies as it is how those studies are being used by each country to, to make their laws. Yes, exactly. Okay. I need to be very alert and quick thinking at my job. Will, take med will taking medical cannabis affect my job? This is definitely a very common question I get. Um, typically the cobalt suspension, cobalt vape, or topical products should not cause any type of sedation at any dose. Um, so if you were looking for also help with sleep or severe pain, we could always do something as needed for you after your work day. But doing it as far as the CBD base or the topicals, you would not have any impairment throughout the day. Um, if you do work at a federal facility, I would definitely check with HR. You can always give an anonymous call to your HR and see what their specific policy is for medical cannabis as well. Um, so this is someone says, I frequently need to increase my dosage. They're taking tangerine um, because their body gets used to it. So the question is that, is there a way to avoid that um, they're concerned that it won't be sustainable to just keep increasing the dosage indefinitely. Absolutely. So as far as the tangerine, um, 
And it depends if you were using it specifically for seizure control or for relief of post-traumatic stress disorder or pain. Um, if you were using it for PTSD or pain, I recommend you could take a few days off every month and that typically will get your tolerance down so you don't need to use as large of a dose or switching dosage forms can help also um, how it's metabolized through the liver is going to be various amounts depending on what dosage form you're using um, so please set up a consult with us and we'd be more than happy to talk about other options for you as well great um, someone wants to know if they could stay on their current medication if they tried CBD and THC. Absolutely. I always tell patients I never want you to change any prescription medications you're taking without talking to your doctor first. Um, a lot of patients continue to take their prescription medications as they always have with cannabis. Cannabis was just that extra tool they needed to get full really. And then there are other patients who with their doctor's help um, get relief from cannabis alone. So we see all kinds of variety. Okay. Um, I have had, uh, let's see here. Um, is there any indication that severe long-term insomnia will be added as a qualifying condition? Everyone wants this, this crystal ball to see what's going to be included in the future. Um, so insomnia, is not, but sleep apnea is. Obstructive sleep apnea, it helps to relax the muscle. Um, so if sleep apnea was a part of your insomnia or post-traumatic stress disorder was tied to insomnia, that could be a way for you. Otherwise, I, I've had a few patients that had really well controlled seizures with their prescription medications, but they were still certified under seizures. And then they came to me and said they wanted help with anxiety or insomnia. So even though it's not a qualifying condition, we can certainly work with you for other goals also. Okay, great. Um, we do have a bit of a testimonial here with reference to epilepsy. This person says they have been part of the study since its inception, went from 40, seizure, 40 to 50 seizures per day down to two. And of course, notes that not everybody might have that success, but um, recommends people look into it. I'm so glad you um, that. Yeah, that's, that's great to share that. Um, a couple of people have mentioned their places that they know certify. I just am reluctant to share those publicly if those doctors have not given you permission to share. Um, so that's certainly something if you want to um, contact me. I now know that information and as an individual I feel like I could do it. I'm just not willing to put that out there when they're not, you know, sure about, uh, about letting people know. Um, I do want to be uh, uh, cognizant of our time and we have a lot more questions so I'm going to try to get us through a few more but then I will collect the rest of those that we might not get to and if would you then Jordan and Noah be willing to um, have me send you those and, and you could reach out to these folks and maybe send them an email with your answer? Would that work? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, Absolutely. I think we have, we have room, time for one or two more. Um, let's see, is there any, indi oh, no, that one was already answered, never mind. Let's move on to the next one. Um, I've heard CBD can decrease vitamin D absorption and can raise something else in the liver. Can you speak on this? I've never heard um, that rumor about the vitamin D, but if you send Noah an email, um, I can certainly look into that a little bit more and get you some information on that. As far as raising something in the liver, um, I've, studies I've looked at, patients even with liver disease who may have elevated liver enzymes are still able to safely use cannabis. Okay. I definitely will get back to you on the vitamin D information. Um... Yeah, and if we're going to be sending out a PDF of the PowerPoint, Noah's email is will be in there and you'll be able to access that. Um, what about the medication Keppra that has controlled my seizure for years? I'm not sure if they're asking if they'd be able to go off it if they got on the CBD or if they're wondering if it would work, if medical cannabis would work in the same way. 
I mean, I don't think anyone's trying to encourage people to stop taking a medication that's working for them if that's not, if no. There, there's no reason to, to go off of it. No, like I say, I've had patients who were qualified under seizures, but they were well controlled with Keppra, but they were looking to help with mood, anxiety, insomnia, other things that weren't necessary, um, qualifying conditions. So if your Keppra has been keeping you well under control, but you're still interested in cannabis, you could still get certified and we could talk about other goals that you're looking at. Definitely don't want you to make any med changes without consulting your neurologist first. Right, absolutely. Okay, well, I think that's all we're going to have time for. I will, like I said, I will collect the rest of these and I will send those out um, to um, Jordan and Noah so that you can get your questions answered. Um, so, again, I want to thank both of you for being here. This has just been really um, interesting and very helpful. And I think you can tell by the level of engagement we have with our questions that this has really struck a chord with people. So thank you so much for, for being here today. And I appreciate you having us. Again, I know these next few weeks are gonna be really busy with my patient load, but you guys get your questions to Noah, and I promise as soon as I have time, I will get those answers to you, absolutely. Great, and Noah, thank you as well. Yes, no, this has been an awesome opportunity, so would love to help in every way we can. Okay, great. So before we wrap up, I just want to remind people who EFMN is and what we do. Uh, we lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. I want to put in a quick plug for our information services department. We do offer free one-on-one -on -one support, both for individuals and families with epilepsy, as well as those who work with people with epilepsy, such as teachers and child care providers, other organizations. Um, whatever the topic is, we offer customized tools and resources to help meet your individual needs for information referrals. So if it's related to epilepsy in any way, feel free to reach out to us. If we can't answer the question, we will try to find answers for you. So please don't hesitate to reach out. You can do that right through our website at that address that you see posted. And then I want to remind everybody, well not remind, but tell everybody, we're excited because this was our first Wellness Wednesday webinar of the new year and we will be having another one on March 30th on the topic of navigating your epilepsy diagnosis. And our featured speakers will be Dr. Alexandra Sakara from Stanford Health and Dr. Brian Mendez with the Minnesota Epilepsy Group. So please go to our website um, and you can find those events on, you'll be able to find that on our events calendar and sign up through the website. So. Um, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you again to our speakers, and I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone.